Well, back at Kauffman Stadium, as you can see, the tarp is still on the field. They had taken it off, and all of a sudden they put it back on because there was a small front coming through, and we're going to be in a rain delay. They say not too long. They hope to get this thing started by 6.30 or 6.40. The field has been prepped. There's no problem with there. All they got to do is take off the tarp, and then they can start the ball game. But in the meantime, we have some field features for you, and one is one of my favorites. It was an interview with Ernie Harwell, who just passed away at the age of 92, back in 1998, about his life in baseball. Ernie, you started off your major league career, a lot of people don't uh, know, with the Brooklyn Dodgers mm -hmm. back in 19, uh, what was it, 1948? 48's right, Hawk. I was uh, working for the Crackers, and uh, Red Barber got sick, and, er and Earl Mann was my boss, and Ranch Ricky called him and said, I'd like for Ernie to come up and replace Red. And uh, Earl Mann said, well, that's all right, Mr. Ricky, but uh, he's under contract with me, and if you really want him, you trade me your catcher. Uh, Cliff Dapper for him. So I was traded for a minor league catcher, and that's the way I got to the big leagues. I went up when Jackie Robinson had just broken the color line. He had a great year the next year. He won the batting title, and the Dodgers won the pennant. So I got in uh, at, a, at a good time in a great ballpark, Abbott Seal. When Jackie came in, you know, that had to be something for you, too, because there was a lot of vulgar things back in those days. Oh, yeah, and it was still going on by the time I got there, and I think uh, that's probably the most significant thing that has happened in American sports since it started. Uh, Jackie breaking the color line, and he made way for all the other great players to follow in, not only in baseball, but in all the other sports. And in life, and in our Absolutely. society, uh, right. you know, in general. Yeah. Also, you were with the Orioles and the Giants, and you happened to see Bobby Thompson's <laughs> home run at 51. Yeah, that was sort of crazy. Russ Hodges and I were broadcasting for the Giants. We were alternating on radio and TV, and it was my turn on TV on October the 3rd, and I felt sorry for Russ because there were five radio broadcasts, and I figured, poor old Russ is going to get lost, you know, on the radio. I'm doing the TV. It's Coast to Coast, the first sports series ever telecast Coast to Coast, and I'll be part of a historic moment. Well, a guy in Jersey who hated the Giants taped Russ's ninth inning, and uh, uh, Chesterfield was our sponsor, so they got the tape, they put it out as a record, and Russ Hodges saying the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant, became the most famous sports broadcast of all time. I was on TV. In those days, we didn't have any replay or any recording at all, and only Mrs. Harwell and I know I was on that afternoon. Well, you joined the Tigers, and, and most people, that's, that's the only thing they associated you with, of course, is the Detroit Tigers, and that's, that's my recollection mm -hmm. of Ernie Harwell as well. Let me just mention a couple of years to you and, and have you recollect a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, when, when it was especially dear to me, obviously, is 1967 when we had, you know, the Tigers and the White Sox and the Twins and the Red Great Sox. Great race. Probably the best race I've ever well, seen. That's what I was going to ask you. Was that the best one you've ever seen? Yeah, we went into that last week, Hawk, and I think there were about four clubs there within a half a game of each other. And I, f I felt that the White Sox would probably win it. Uh, but they had some trouble in Kansas City. I think they lost a couple of doubleheaders there. Uh, yeah, Catfish Hunter, yeah. Chuck Dobson mm -hmm. beat him in a doubleheader. And uh, then, of course, uh, Boston went on to win it, and, and the Tigers came close. And the Tigers had a real chance. They had two doubleheaders the last two days, and they divided each doubleheader. If they'd won one more game, they would have been in there. So how and about now the next year, 68, with you guys? Well, that was good. The uh, Tigers in 68 uh, uh, figured they got so close in 67, uh, they could win it in 68. And they played uh, very well. It was sort of a come-from-behind team uh, featuring uh, Denny McLean, who won 31, and uh, Mickey Lolich. And you had a lot of power on that team. You had Freehand, Northrop, and, and uh, Willie Horton. And uh, a lot of guys could swing the bat. But, you know, they didn't have a 300 hitter. I think uh, Horton was a leading hitter. He hit about 285 that year. But uh, they had good balance. They had, uh, they had uh, good defense, and they had a lot of power. Well, Mickey Lolich was certainly the guy in the, in the series winning those three ball games. But still, my all-time, I, I played played against the Tigers for a long time, and my all-time player was number six. Oh, no question about it. Al Kaline was a consummate Tiger. He could do everything well, and he had a, such a high degree of consistency. I don't think people appreciated how good he really was because he was always good. He didn't have those peaks and valleys that most players do, those ups and downs. And in my mind's eye, Hawk, uh, I remember Kaline chasing the ball in the corner, grabbing it, you know, a base hit, turning, pivoting, and firing into second base, and that guy better not try to get the second. He'd oh. be out. How about the 84 club? 84 team was a lot different than most. It got out in front in every game, and then it had that 
terrific 35 and 5 record in the first 40 games. Nobody came close. The uh, Blue Jays got winning about seven games a couple of times and then they fell back and then they won the uh, playoff with Kansas City, uh, swept the playoffs and then they beat San Diego with ease in the World Series. Everything you could ask of a team, that team did. And they had another great Tiger on that ball club, Alan Trammell. Oh yeah, Alan Trammell, Whitaker, Lance Paris, Jack Morris had a great year. Milt Wilcox had a good year. Wilcox almost pitched a perfect game. Morris had a no-hitter. And it, again, it was a matter of uh, defense and good pitching and enough hitting to keep them going. Ernie, in all your years in baseball, the guys that really stand out in Ernie Harwell's mind pitching, if you had to have somebody go out there in the seventh game of the World Series that would win a game for your family's life, <laughs> who, who would be the couple guys? Well, I'd have a couple of them. I think my left-handers would probably be Warren Spahn, who won more games than any left-hander, and uh, Sandy Koufax, who was uh, so dominant over a short period. And as a right-hander, I think I'd have to take a Bob Gibson. I don't think I've seen anybody any more intimidating and looked like he had the game under control any more than Gibson did. Ernie, what about also some of the great hitters that you've seen? Of course, Ted Williams, you know, is he's, he's well, got to be I think right you got to start with Ted Williams. I don't think there's any question about that. He's the he's probably the consummate hitter. And uh, I think uh, Tony Gwynn's uh, right up there. And uh, of course, uh, Rod Carew had some some great years. And as we look at power, I think you've got to think about uh, McGuire. But the thing that really fascinates me too is you're a very accomplished songwriter. I didn't know you have written 50 pieces. You got <laughs> B.J. Thomas, you got Mitch Ryder, you got Barbara Lewis, and all these people who've done your work. Well, I don't know how accomplished, but I've had about uh, I'd say 50, 60 records, and I always tell people I got more no-hitters than Nolan Ryan has. <laughs> <laughs> Hall of Famer Ernie Harwell. A great friend, a great announcer, and baseball has lost one of its greatest people. And we'll be back.